Welcome to Organic Chemistry. This is our fourth lecture video. Uh, before we get into the actual new material, let us do a quick review of what we looked at last lecture. Lewis Dutch structure. Again, I'm emphasizing and um, reminding you that you should be able to draw Lewis Dutch structures for just about any molecule. What you will need, of course, is your periodic table to, so you can determine the valence electrons for each atom and you distribute the electrons around each atom in the molecule so that there is an octet of electrons around each atom, of course, excluding hydrogen also encourage you to include the non-bonding electrons in your Lewis dot structures. This will become extremely important when we are looking at reactions and reactivity of molecules because the non-bonding electrons are typically the ones that react first. Next we looked at resonance structures. By definition, resonance structures here are equivalent Lewis dot structures. Resonance structures differ from each other, typically around double bonds, and of course triple bonds, but for this course, mostly double bonds. So if you're asked to draw Lewis dot structures or resonance structures, look out for and identify the double bonds in the region of the molecule and in that region is where the electrons can be redistributed to get other resonance structures. Once again remember that there are specific arrows that are used to indicate the movement of electrons to generate the new resonance structures. And lastly, we looked at hybridized orbitals. So the VESPA theory is one model that's used to describe the electronic distribution around um, atoms in a molecule. But they're not, that theory is not sufficient to describe other properties, such as bond lengths and reactivities, for example. So we'll have to develop another molecule and the, another model, and the model that's developed here is hybridized orbitals or mixing of orbitals. Last lecture we looked at the sp3 and the sp2, but we'll start today's lecture by a review of the sp2 orbitals. So let's start. Here is ethene, or ethylene. It is a molecule which has two carbons, one, two, and four hydrogens. So here is the Lewis dot structure, where if you look at your periodic table, you can determine the number of valence electrons in this molecule, which would include the valence electrons for carbon and the valence electrons for hydrogens. A distribution around each atom gives eight, so this carbon here has four and two, eight electrons around this carbon. This carbon has eight electrons around this carbon. And of course, hydrogen being an exception has two. So this is the Lewis dot structure. Here's another way of drawing the Lewis dot structure in which we will use the bonding electrons and represent them as a line. So we can use lines to represent bonding electrons. Notice each line is, represents two electrons. So here we have four electrons here, and here we have two lines, which is a double bond. 
The Vesper theory predicts that this molecule is flat and the bond angle here is 120 degrees. Because remember from the Vesper theory, the electrons are trying to get as far away from each other as possible. And in so doing, this is the geometry that results. That's about all the Vesper theory can tell you. It will not tell you if this bond here, a double bond, is shorter or longer than your average carbon-carbon bond, single bond. So another model that is used is the molecular orbital model theory to describe the bonding between atoms in a molecule. So let us look at that theory. But before I do, just want to point out to you that here is a carbon and it is bonded to one, a hydrogen, two, another hydrogen, and three, a carbon. So there are three bonds from that carbon to three other atoms. Three equivalent bonds to make that covalent bond, or to make those covalent bonds. Okay, so let's look at how we can use the molecular orbital theory to describe the bonding in a molecule. Here's carbon. And of course, as you know, looking at your periodic table, carbon has six electrons. So here are the six electrons here in the orbital. And this is now a diagrammatic representation of the orbital and the electrons in the orbitals, where the 1s is low in energy and the 2s is higher. And of course, the 2p is a little higher in energy. So, remember we need three equivalent orbitals to bond to the atoms on each carbon atom in ethylene. So, to create three equivalent orbitals, we do what's called hybridization or mixing. So, here we mix the 2s orbital and two of the 2p's. Notice that since the 2p orbitals, 2px, 2py, and 2pz are all equivalent, we could mix any two. So it does not necessarily have to be the 2x or the 2py. It could be the 2px or the 2pz. But the bottom line is to mix two to get three equivalent orbitals. Notice three equivalent and one unhybridized orbital over here. One unhybridized p orbital. We have put back in our electron, so we have one electron here in the sp2, and we have another electron here, and another electron here, and of course the last electron goes into the 2p unhybridized orbital. Why it doesn't pair is because this energy gap here is so small that it prefers to go into the other orbital instead of pairing. So here are the three orbitals that are equivalent and those are the three orbitals that will bond to hydrogen another hydrogen, and to another carbon. And of course, it has here an electron in the p orbital. I know that's very challenging to visualize, so let's see if we can give you a better visual of this diagrammatic representation of the sp2 orbital. So here's another way of looking at it. So here's the carbon. It has here sp2 orbital with one electron. It has here another sp2 orbital with one electron. And it has a third equivalent sp2 orbital with one electron. So here comes hydrogen. Hydrogen with one electron, 
will now bond as shown here. Same here. And of course here is another carbon that has one electron in its sp2 orbital and it will make this bond here. So those are the three equivalent sp2 orbitals that's used for bonding. The p orbital here, the unhybridized p orbital, each will have one electron contained. These two electrons will form here a, another bond. That bond is called a pi bond. So instead of drawing the molecule like this, the way we will draw molecules from here on will be like this, where here's our carbon and its sp2 hybridized orbitals are bonded to hydrogen another hydrogen, and to another carbon. And this P, this pi bond is made from the two electrons on the adjacent P orbitals. Let me point out here, and I'll emphasize later on, the percent mixing is 66% P and 33% S. That will become very important later on when we look at the bond length and reactivities of these molecules. So this here, the sp2, has more s character than the sp3. Because the sp3, as we said last lecture, had 25% s. This has 33% S, but we'll emphasize that more when we start looking at the properties of these molecules. Here's another representation, and as you can imagine, one of the challenges in organic chemistry is to visualize these molecules. You'll have to visualize these molecules because when we start doing the reactions, we need to know where these electrons are. So we'll have to visualize these molecules in three dimensions. So if you have a model set, you may want to build ethylene. And you may want to see the geometry. And you may want to see what the pi bond looks like. Because when we start doing the reactions, these are the electrons that we will be using first for reactions from the pi bond. Notice there are two aspects to the pi bond because as we said earlier, the p orbital looks like an hourglass, a top and a bottom. So even though there are two aspects, it's described as one pi bond, one pi bond. So therefore, we have here a double bond where this is our sigma bond. And of course, this is our pi bond. And that's the double bond. So that is a representation of a carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, let's look here at another structure. And this one here is acetylene. So if you're asked to draw the Lewis dot structure of acetylene, which is C2H2, you'd go back to your periodic table. You would determine how many um, valence electrons are there in C2H2 and you will distribute those electrons so that each atom has an octet of electrons. Of course, hydrogen only has two. So let's look at this structure. So here is a carbon and it has here eight electrons. Two, four, six, and eight electrons. Similarly, this carbon here has eight electrons because it has these two and now these four. And that's why these bonds are called covalent bonds because the electrons are shared between the atoms. Another way of drawing this is using lines to represent bonding electrons. So lines are used to represent bonding electrons. So this 
line here represents these two electrons. These three lines here represent, represent these six electrons. So this is what you need to visualize. Using the VESPA theory, this is what we come up with, where this bond angle here is 180 degrees because the electrons want to get as far away from each other as possible. And of course the geometry is of course linear. So what we need here is to use the hybridized model or the uh, molecular orbital theory to explain the geometry and other features about acetylene. Before I go on to that though, let me emphasize again that this carbon here is bonded to one and two other atoms. One and two other atoms. So we need two bonds, two equivalent bonds to form a bond, bonds to hydrogen and to carbon for each carbon atom. Okay, let's see. So here, let's go back to our um, molecular, the, the, the um, electronic distribution of the atoms. So here's carbon again. And here's what we're familiar with, the ground state. We call that the ground state because this is what you will see from the periodic table based on the electronic distribution. But in this case, we need two equivalent orbitals. So in this case, we will mix here one S and only one of the P. So we'll mix one of, we'll mix the two S and one of the two P. Notice again, it could be two PX or it could be two PY or two PZ. And they are equivalent, so it could be any one of those two P's. But the bottom line is that we get here two equivalent SP. Notice the terminology, SP, because we've mixed one S and we've mixed one P. So we have an SP hybrid or hybridized orbitals. And of course, we have two unhybridized P orbitals. Notice a little higher in energy, just a little higher in energy. And now let's put back in our electron. So we have one electron in our sp and another electron in our sp, sp. And the other two electrons go into the unhybridized 2p. Unhybridized 2p. Again, they do not pair because the energy gap here is so small that it does not pair. So this represents the hybridized orbitals for acetylene. Let us see if we can represent that a little differently as shown here. So here's our carbon and it has an sp orbital with one electron and an sp orbital with one electron. As you can imagine, hydrogen which has one electron, bonds here. And another carbon, which has one electron in its sp orbital, bonds here. And here's where it becomes interesting. We have two, S, two p orbitals on each carbon. Two unhybridized p orbital, orbitals on each carbon, and each has one electron. They're sitting right beside each other, so therefore we can form a pi bond here and a pi bond here. So that's two pi bonds. And of course, here is where it's represented here as a triple bond, which is really two pi bonds, and a sigma bond. Before we go on to the next slide, let me emphasize, because we have an SP, we now have 
50% S character, more S. I'm emphasizing S because S is closer to the nucleus, and if we put electrons close to the nucleus, that is good because of the positive charge, opposite charges. But we'll emphasize that more later on. The bottom line is, this is the structure of acetylene as drawn, but you should know that this carbon here is sp hybridized, and this is our triple bond in which there are two pi bonds. Okay. I think the next slide has, yeah, this one has a little better description of it. So let's see what we have here. So here are the two p orbitals that are unhybridized, and it forms here our two pi bonds, and this is our sigma bond bonds to hydrogen and to carbon. What I'm doing here is kind of difficult because I am trying to communicate to you a structure that you should be real, really visualizing in three dimensions. And of course I only have the computer screen to show this to you and that is why I'm using so many different screens or so many different slides to communicate what this looks like. So what you may want to do is take your model set here and build acetylene. So you can see it, it is linear and you can see that the triple bonds or the two pi bonds are there and that they are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so go ahead and do that. So let's look at a summary here, what we have done so far. So let's look at this molecule here and see if you can, um, uh, if you agree with this. So here, A, so atom here, atom A here, which is carbon, it is sp3. Why sp3? Because sp3 really means s1 p3, which means four equivalent orbitals or four orbitals from carbon bonded to four other atoms. Let's see if that's true. So this is a carbon that's bonded to oxygen. It is bonded to another carbon. And don't forget that we have a hydrogen here and another hydrogen over here, but that's not shown because we are using here the line angle formalism. So you should know that there are two hydrogens there. So here are our four bonds, four equivalent sp3 bonds. If they're sp3, we know it's tetrahedral and the bond angles are around 109.5. Let's look at B. So this carbon right here, notice again we're using the line angle, so we do not show C as carbon. But wherever there is an intersection, there is a carbon. Let's do the analysis. It's a triple bond, so it's bonded only to one and to two other atoms. So it really has two equivalent orbitals that are bonded to two atoms. That means that it's S1, P1. Of course, we do not usually put the ones in. We just say it's SP. And an SP, of course, as you know, is linear with a bond angle of 180 degrees. Let's look at C. C is over here. So C is bonded to carbon. It's bonded to another carbon, and it's bonded to an oxygen. Three equivalent bonds needed to bond to these three atoms. If you need three bonds, more than likely you will need sp3. The geometry of an sp3 is trigonal planar, and the bond angle is 120. Let's see D. So D is bonded to one atom, two atoms, and a third atom over here. 
So it's no surprise that D is sp2, which is trigonoplanar and similarly a bond angle of 120 degrees. You should be able to recognize the hybridized orbitals that are used in bonding for each atom in a molecule. Let's look here at heteroatoms. So we have we know that organic molecules mostly have carbons and hydrogens, but they do contain heteroatoms. And of course, hetero here means different. So the heteroatoms that we will encounter will be mostly nitrogen and oxygen, sometimes and, and, and of course the halogens, but mostly oxygen and nitrogens. So let's look at this, water. If you were asked what type orbitals are used to bond from oxygen, let's do the analysis. It is bonded to one other atom, so that's one orbital that's needed, another that's needed here, but electrons need to go in orbitals. So we, here we have two electrons, a pair of electrons. We need an orbital to put those in. Remember that an orbital has a maximum of two electrons. So you can't put four electrons in an orbital, in one orbital. So that would imply also that we need another orbital to put these two electrons in. So we will need four, four orbitals. How do we get four orbitals? We get four orbitals from sp3 hybridize, hybridization. So this oxygen here has to be sp3 hybridized in which two electrons are in one of those orbitals, two electrons, the other two electrons are in the other orbital, and of course the other two are used to bond to hydrogen. So you'd expect, you would expect the sp3 to be tetrahedral, but it's not because the geometry here describes only atoms and not electrons. So it's described as bent. As you can see, it is bent. Bond angle is around 104 because the electrons in the orbitals, the non-bonding electrons in the orbitals, they take up a little more space, so it squeezes the bonding electrons further down. Let's look at ammonia. So this would be easy to apply because let's do a similar analysis. Nitrogen, what is the orbitals or the type hybridization around nitrogen? Let's see how many orbitals we need, how many equivalent orbitals needed. We need one to bond to hydrogen, another one here, another one here, and of course a fourth to put that unshared pair of electrons. So you can imagine it is also sp3 hybridized, where only one pair of electron goes into the equivalent sp3 orbital. The geometry you would expect to be tetrahedral, but it's not because we're only looking at these atoms to predict the geometry. So, of course, as you know from the Vespa theory, it's pyramidal with a bond angle around 105 degrees. Again, these electrons here, the non-bonding electrons in the sp3 hybridized orbitals, orbital in this case, takes up more space, so it squeezes the bond angle a little um, closer together compared to that of methane, if it were all hydrogens. Okay, let's look at another example here, and this is oxygen. Let's look at this oxygen here. What's the hybridized state of that oxygen? Let's do the analysis. This oxygen is bonded to carbon, that's one orbital that's needed. It also has a, elect a pair of electrons. We must put that in an orbital. It has another pair of electrons. 
which we must put in an orbital. So therefore, it is sp2 hybridized because we need three equivalent orbitals, one to bond to carbon, as I said earlier, and two will contain the electrons. Of course, as you know, if you have an sp2 hybridized, there's one unhybridized p orbital, and there's a carbon here that's also sp2 hybridized, and that's why we have here our pi bond. Okay, and that's a double bond, one, a sigma bond, and a pi bond. Let's look at this nitrogen here. And let's do the analysis. This nitrogen is bonded to one other atom here, carbon, and we have a pair of electrons, non-bonding electrons, which must go into an orbital. So we need an orbital to put that in. So we need two equivalent orbitals on nitrogen. As you can imagine, if you have, if you need two equivalent orbitals, we'll have an sp hybridized nitrogen atom in this case, um, nitrogen in this case. And of course, if it's sp2, there are two p orbitals that are unhybridized, and that's where we have our two pi bonds to nitrogen, and that's called the triple bond. So you should be able to recognize the hybridized states for any atom in an organic molecule. Okay, here is a question. So, as you probably figured out by now, you will have a quiz coming up on, when is it, Thursday? And here is a typical question that you can get because um, multiple choice is a good way of testing some of these concepts. So here we're asking you to apply the concepts that we just discussed to solving a problem. Here is the problem. For the molecule shown below, select the correct statement. Notice I'm underlining um, what's needed or the important aspects in this problem of atoms A and B. So we have to examine atoms A and B and select a correct statement. Atom A. So let's look at the first um, possibility. The bonding orbitals for atom A is sp3. Is that true? Hmm. This carbon here is bonded to 1 and 2 other atoms. So more than likely it probably is not sp2, sp3. So we need not read any further. The bonding orbitals of atom A is sp2. Again it's bonded to one and two other atoms. So it probably it's not sp2 because to be sp2 it needs to be bonded to three other atoms. Let's look at the third, try C. Atom B, now we're looking at atom B, is sp2. So let's see if that is true. This carbon is bonded to one, two, and three atoms. So that's reasonable. Now we have to check. It says the angles around this is 109.5. Not true, because we know that the angles around an sp2 is 120 degrees. Okay, let's look at the last possibility. It's sp2. We just agreed that it's sp2, and the bond angles are 120. Seems reasonable. So what you may want to do at this point is to pause the video and work this through again to make sure you understand what's being asked Make sure you understand the choices, the selections, and make sure you pick one that's best, the most reasonable one. The next slide has my choice. So in this case, I've chosen here D, and that seems reasonable because that matches for atom B.
and the others do not. So look out for questions like this on your quiz and on your test. Let's go on. So, for example, I won't answer this one, but for example, you should be able to determine, look at each of these atoms and determine if it's sp, sp2, or sp3. This one. I'll tell you a couple. This is sp2, sp2, sp3, because there are two hydrogens bonded to it. You should be able to look also at at oxygen atoms to determine. So this oxygen atom here, is it sp, sp2, or sp3? Don't forget, even though these electrons are not drawn in, but you should know that there are, in fact, here a pair of, or two pairs of electrons. So once you put those in, you will quickly recognize that that atom there is sp2. How about this one? This oxygen here again has two unshared pair of electrons, but now it's bonded to a hydrogen, it's bonded to a carbon, and it's it has two pairs of electrons that you must put in orbitals, so more than likely that's an sp3 hybridized oxygen. Okay, so once again, you may want to look at different molecules in your book and you may, will have to determine what hybridized carbons or atoms are used to make those bondings. That's very important because when we start doing the reactions, as I mentioned earlier, you will need to know the type hybridized um, orbitals that are present. Okay, let's quickly go on to another topic here, and this is intermolecular attraction. So what we've been looking at is intra, which means the bonding within molecules, how the atoms are connected to each other within molecules. So now we're looking at the attraction across molecules, inter, across molecules. So you will need at least two molecules here to look at intermolecular attractions or the molecular attractions between these two molecules. There are three types, dipole-dipole moment, dipole-dipole attraction, hydrogen bonding, and London forces. So we'll do a quick review of each and the effect of these on the physical properties of molecules. First, we look at the dipole-dipole intermolecular attraction. As you know, here is a carbon that's bonded to a chlorine. Look at your periodic table. You will see that chlorine is to the right of carbon. So therefore, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, which means that these electrons in this bond here are not equally distributed between carbon and chlorine. But they are closer to the more electronegative chlorine than carbon. Hence, we use a symbol here, partial negative, to show that this chlorine contains more electrons surrounding it compared to carbon, which has a partial positive, because it has less atoms, elect electrons, surrounding it. As a result, if you have another molecule of the same molecule, you can see that there is an attraction because, of course, as you know, opposites will attract. So since this carbon here is partially positive and this chlorine here is partially negative, there is an attraction. This is called a dipole-dipole. Why dipole-dipole? Because we have two poles here, partial negative and partial positive. So this is the attraction between these two molecules. Let's see the effect of physical properties. So, the boiling points of different liquids with the same molecular mass are different or can be different due to intermolecular attraction. So these two molecules here, acetone 
and methyl vinyl ether, they have the same molecular mass. So that means that they, if there were no intermolecular attractions, the boiling point of these two liquids should be the same. But if there are intermolecular attractions, they may be different. Now, they will be different. Acetone here has a dipole right here, as we discussed before. This dipole is not as strong as over here, so the dipole-dipole attraction for acetone is greater. So if you are boiling this liquid, it takes more heat to break these intermolecular attractions. If you have to apply more heat, it means that the boiling point will be higher compared to another liquid where the intermolecular attractions are much weaker and requires less heat to break those dipole-dipole attractions and hence a lower boiling point. Let's look at another type intermolecular attraction, hydrogen bonding. This is the same as dipole-dipole attraction, except that it now includes hydrogen. Looking at your periodic table, you'll see that hydrogen is the most electropositive atom on the periodic table. So if it is bonded to an electronegative atom such as oxygen, the electrons in this bond here, those two electrons, are much closer to the oxygen than to the hydrogen. Hence, we represent that by a partial negative, more negative, and of course this hydrogen here is a partial positive. So we have another molecule over here, which is the same, partial positive and a partial negative and as you can imagine opposites attract so we have here a dipole dipole attraction but because it involves hydrogen it's called a hydrogen bond hydrogen bonds are much stronger than dipole dipole attraction because of the difference in electronegativities. So hydrogen bonds are very important in chemistry. Let's see one consequence. Here we have two molecules that have the same molecular weight. So you'd expect them to have the same boiling point if there were no intermolecular attraction. This molecule here, ethanol, has the potential to form hydrogen bond because of this hydrogen being very electropositive and this oxygen here being partially negative. The boiling point is pretty high because we'll have to break those hydrogen bonds to have the liquid boil. There are no hydrogen bonding in this molecule here, which is dimethyl ether. Notice no hydrogen is bonded to an electronegative atom such as oxygen. It's bonded to carbon, which is not as electronegative. The boiling point, as you can see here, is twi minus 23.6 compared to 70. 8.5 degrees Celsius. So again, you should be able to look at two liquids and determine which should have a higher boiling point based on the type intermolecular attraction. So you need to identify them first and apply that concept to the effect on boiling point. Let us look at the third one. And last, this is London forces, or Van der Waals forces. Remember that from your Gen Chem. So if you have a molecule, which is represented here, 
It's pretty large. We say it's polarizable. That's another term for large, polarizable. So just imagine you have a very large balloon, water in a very large balloon. It's polarizable, which means that it can change its shape at any point. If the molecule is pretty large, you can imagine sometimes all the electrons will be on one aspect, one area of the molecule, which means this side is very negative or partially negative. This side here would be the opposite, partially positive. If that happens, you can imagine another molecule that that's happening too, where this side here is partially negative. There is an attraction between that sides or the, that aspect of the molecule. It's very weak, as you can imagine, and we call those the London forces or um, um, Van der Waals attraction. Very weak, but they are there. So here is a large molecule, as shown here, and another molecule, the same molecule. You can imagine here that there are, in fact, attractions that are possible because these molecules are large and are polarizable. Let's apply that concept. So if we have here three molecules that have the same molecular mass, you would expect again they, they all should have the same boiling point based on weights because they have the same weight same energy to vaporize it from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. If they are intermolecular attractions, however, heat much, must be supplied to break these intermolecular attractions so that the molecules can go into the vapor phase from the liquid phase. Let's look at this molecule here. Two, well, we haven't gotten in terms of the naming yet, but notice it's very compact. A nice circular molecule, very compact molecule, less surface area. So we would not expect that molecule to be very polarizable, like having a very small balloon with water. Not polarizable. The water doesn't swish around a lot. This molecule, however, here is a little larger, a little more polarizable. And the third molecule here is a larger, more polarizable molecule. Notice I'm saying larger just in terms of surface area. It's not larger in terms of weight. It's larger in terms of surface area. So this molecule here has the smallest surface area. And this molecule here has the largest surface area. So you would expect this molecule here to have more attractions, intermolecular attractions with another molecule. And that type of attraction would be Van der Waals attraction because there are no hydrogen bonding here, there are no dipole um, bonds here, so it would be Van der Waals attraction, so you'd expect this molecule here to have a high boiling point compared to this molecule here which has less surface area, less intermolecular Van der Waals attraction, and hence a lower boiling point because it would require less heat to break those very weak Van der Waals attractions. So if given these three molecules, can you predict without looking down here, without looking here, which would have the highest boiling point? or which would have the lowest boiling point. What we're asking you here is, can you recognize the type intermolecular attractions and its effects on the boiling point? Okay, so that is the end of 
chapter 1. Um, so continue to study the material in chapter 1, work the problems. Um, remember again, my, concept, my uh, um, approach here is for us to not only know the concepts here, but be able to apply the concepts to solve different problems. So continue reading the chapter, working the problems, and of course the tutorial questions are designed to help reinforce these concepts and your applications of these concepts. So don't forget we have a quiz on Thursday. So continue studying hard and I will post the next lecture video um, shortly. So 